2000, when I first came back to Montreal, um, Ed started organizing the very first uh, monthly gatherings of uh, web bloggers in Montreal called Your Blog, uh, and he is awesome. Can everyone hear me? Uh, a couple of quick historical notes before we get started. First, uh, this is apparently what Unitarians, one of whom was my great-grandmother, uh, were talking about in 1891. Second, uh, in 2012, uh, you can no longer find corn doilies, or at least not very easily. I checked last night on uh, Etsy.com, and they have no such items, which is frankly shocking when you consider the rest of the stuff they sell. <laughs> and when asked, uh, Google helpfully suggests that you may have more luck searching for corn dollies, which are a real thing. Hello again. Uh, it is my pleasure and my privilege uh, to be here today and to be given the opportunity to do the opening keynote. Um, I'm not a librarian. <laughs> Um, and it is spe especially nice for me to be back in Montreal. Um, I've been away for almost eight years, uh, faffing about first in San Francisco and now New York. Um, but this is always home. Uh, and the expression in French is uh, chez moi. Um, and that's what Montreal is. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, everyone from, from McGill for existing, because I went to high school across the street from McGill and frequently skipped class and went and hung out uh, in the campus, which was awesome. This is a photo of one of my favorite pieces of local graffiti taken in 2003. Uh, there's a condo now uh, in the place where the parking lot is, so in theory, one day when that condo is demolished um, by our future selves, this will still be there. I was chatting with a friend the other day uh, about this talk, and he said, so what's your thesis statement? <laughs> I said, uh, well, I'm not sure I have one yet. I, I also think it might be too soon for thesis statements. Um, what I want to do over the course of the next 45 minutes, an hour or so, is to make an argument and work through some ideas that something is happening, something very real is happening, and it's not necessarily a thing that we have to worry about today or even tomorrow. But in the way that the day after tomorrow always sort of creeps up on us faster than we expect, it's probably something we should at least be talking about today. Um, I'm here for the entire conference. Uh, so to the extent that you agree or disagree, and especially if you disagree with me, uh, please come find me and let's talk about it. Otaku. Does everyone here know what the, the, the phrase refers to? I learned about it uh, in the first issue of Wired magazine back in the 90s when we still uh, found out about the rest of the world from little pieces of media that were distributed on a regular schedule through space and time. Um, the term is Japanese and refers to a subculture of people who obsessively collect things, typically uh, pop culture, lowbrow, unimportant stuff and they really are obsessive. They have these massive, massive catalogs. Um, the term is still considered to be somewhat of a pejorative, although it has been repurposed to basically mean any group of serious amateur collectors. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit the Henry Ford. I think I'm, I'm just gonna say this because, oh, it's fine, there's plenty of photos. They're all over the internet, there's nothing secret. I had the opportunity to visit the Henry Ford uh, Museum a couple weeks ago, and we got a tour of the back rooms, and we, we were going through the archives, and there's a, we came across a box full of soap, like detergent. Um, there's somebody who's been collecting this stuff for 40, 50 years, and so this is an amazing catalog of graphic design and powder. Um, so there's some real questions about how they're actually going to preserve that, or really what the point is. But that's otaku. And while I was looking up exact definitions for the term, um, I came across a lovely passage from William Gibson's novel, Odoru. In it he wrote, the otaku, the passionate, obsessive, the information ages embodiment of the connoisseur, more consume, concerned with the accumulation 
of data than of objects seems a natural crossover figure in today's interface of British and Japanese cultures. I can see it in the eyes of the portobello dealers and in the eyes of the Japanese collectors. A perfectly calm train spotter frenzy, murderous and sublime. Understanding otakuhood, I think, is one of the keys to understanding the culture of the web. There is something profoundly post-national about it, extra geographic. We are all curators in the postmodern world, whether we want to be or not. So with that in mind, I'm going to start this presentation by telling uh, three short stories, uh, one from each of the last three years. This is a screenshot from Flickr. Um, it's a gallery, uh, as the name suggests, of President Obama fist bumping people. <laughs> My work is done. Uh, galleries were a thing that were introduced at Flickr in 2009, and they were introduced as a way to try and encourage the membership to think about the site differently, to start to reflect on the breadth and the depth of what at that point were already five billion photos. To think about their own individual experiences with the site. You know, at that point, five billion photos in, it's up to eight now. You know, imagine what it's like at Facebook where they have like 80 trillion photos. People still thought that we went through those, the daily uploads one at a time and were choosing them. They thought we were responsible for what got into the explore section. And as a result, people lost their minds because they thought we were doing the choosing and why was, you know, photo X better than photo Y. And we really needed some way to try and get people to break out of that model. And so there were only two rules for galleries. The first was no more than 18 photos, and none of them could be your own photos. After that, it was up to you. We were more interested in trying to encourage people to consider the act of choosing than about anything that came out the other end. I did a paper about this a year later um, and about a larger trend that you could see of people starting to discover uh, and, and to flex what I call the curatorial muscle. Curating is, a, is kind of a dirty word by now um, because it's been overused. And my argument was not that people were curating in the sense that museums and galleries curate works but that when you scratch the surface, the motivation was the same. It was the act of choosing. It was the thought process that goes into the relationships between more, one or more things next to each other. And I talked about how there was a still nascent but very, very confusing smushing up of the roles between critics and experts, curators, and docents who were largely considered just to be you know, convenient amateurs to offload the burden of talking to people. Um, and this felt like a similar blurring that had been going on for a while uh, between art and craft and design. This really happened, by the way. Um, so I came back to this idea a year later um, when I was asked to be involved in a panel about art and cartography. And cartographic circles are kind of obsessed. It's the perennial debate about whether a map is useful or simply pretty. Uh, and so when I was asked to be on the panel, I sort of I stopped and I thought about it, and it reminded me a lot of the debate around art and craft and design. Um, I studied painting in the mid-90s, and the debate back then around the relationship between art and craft specifically was vicious and brutal. Uh, and designers were kind of relegated to the sides the way that cartographers are still today, which is we know that there's skill in what they do and we know that there's an aesthetic, but no one is ready to call it capital A art. Um, and I think one of the reasons the debate was so harsh back then was that in the mid to late 90s, we could all feel the ground underneath us shifting. 
but no one could really articulate what was going on or why. Uh, fast forward to the present, and it's pretty hard to deny that what's happened is the economic underpinnings, the things that distinguish those three roles, which were largely about the economics around production and distribution, have collapsed. They're gone. Design studios, including the one that I used to work at called Stamen, routinely get called out for producing art pieces devoid of any functional use. Artists are making bags for luxury designers. That's not art, I'm just saying. And the craftspeople, the printmakers, the textile makers, everything that we used to think of just like little vernacular art, uh, <laughs> They're making money hand over fist and pretty much rule the internet right now. Um, Etsy made half a billion dollars in the first half of this year. That's with a B, and they haven't even gotten to the holiday season. The reason I mentioned this in the context of cartography is that, at least with maps, we have often assumed that the amount of time it takes to produce a map is a convenient stand-in for assessing its value. The logic goes, why would anyone spend 10 years compiling all of that data, figuring out how to represent it, producing the map, unless they were serious and earnest in their <coughs> intent? It's another way of saying time is money. So again, it's that stand-in of economics for value or worth. Not all maps are created equally. The argument here is not that things that take a long time are suddenly valueless. It's that the counter-argument no longer holds. You can no longer say in 2012 that a map that was produced quickly and cheaply is de facto less valuable than something that took 10 years. It's just the reality. I mean, it's a good time to be making maps. The technology stack has advanced so far and so fast that it's amazing what you can do. Um, but as a result, one measure uh, of confidence in our ability to judge things has gotten completely messed up. And we, or at least the cartographers, are still trying to figure out how to get their bearings. This is the shortest of the three stories because I'm still trying to make sense of what happened. Everything I've described so far is increasingly happening with robotics as well. Um, I sat in on an informal conversation between a robotics engineer and a lot of people, a lot of new media artists. And it was a curious thing because uh, it wasn't hostile, there was no debate, but it was really, it was a, a discussion where they were trying to figure out where robots are supposed to fit into the cultural spectrum, right? Is it art? Is it? And no one could figure it out. They were really struggling. And, and it was that same thing where they're like, well, we know what you're doing is, is hard and there's skill, but I don't think it's art. And so in that way, um, it turns out that engineers are the new folk art. This is a picture of a screen, of a picture of somebody with a screen taking a picture of arguably real life, although there is a big glass screen separating that person from the jellyfish. I told you all these stories because I want to use them to set up an idea that, uh, to, to my surprise, has proven to be a remarkably effective way to pick a fight in the cultural heritage world. This is the part where I invite you to come and find me after the talk. And it's that the distinction between museums and archives, and by extension libraries, is collapsing in most people's minds. And that assumes that it ever existed in the first place. I'm not talking about people in this room. We talk shop, we live and breathe this stuff. 
I'm talking about everyone else. I think there really is the assumption that archives are sort of just like the basement for museums. When I say the distinction, I mean both the roles and the relationship that they have one another, to one another. And when I say collapsing, I don't mean a catastrophic end of days. It's okay, we're not going back to year zero. What I mean though is that they're all sort of starting to pass through one another simultaneously in the same way that art and craft and design is very confused right now. We still have artists, craftspeople, and designers, but no one's sure how to self-identify. So what's happening is a kind of smushing together. Um, all you have to do is consider uh, Rhizome's art base. For those of you who don't know Rhizome, uh, they've been around for, since the 90s, and they've been documenting net art. And art base is described as an online archive of digital art. Uh, I mentioned that I've lived in Quebec for a long time, which means that I've lived through my fair share of province-wide blackouts um, that were caused by like a box the size of your iPhone shorting and the entire province went dark. So I understand that uh, electricity is still the weak link in all of this. But to the extent that ArtBase is always on, it's no longer clear to me when I visit ArtBase whether I'm looking at an archive, an index, it's searchable, they have metadata, it's structured, um, or a showcase. I don't know. I mean, and as we continue to digitize all of the things, as we continue to make 3D models of things, as we consider to run all of the texts we have through OCR. What does that mean? Here's part of the reason I think this is happening. This is a photograph of a warehouse equipped with robots from Kiva Systems. Kiva was purchased by Amazon last year. And that was a year or two after they had purchased Zappos, the online shoe manufacturer. Uh, Amazon did not purchase Zappos for their user base or for their catalog of shoes. That's the last thing Amazon needs right now. The reason they purchased both of these companies is for their robots and their warehouses. Um, they're pretty amazing pieces of technology. Uh, and they're terrifying in a way because their robotness uh, allows for an efficiency of storage and retrieval, and that's really all that's going on here. Um, it's figuring out how to pack the most number of things into the smallest amount of space, and then to be able to get it out as fast as possible. Um, they're able to do things that we as humans with our little puny, meaty limbs just can't do. Um, I have friends who've actually had the opportunity to visit one of these warehouses, and aside from the fact that they have QR codes all over the floor, which they, the robots are reading with cameras underneath them, they have lasers all along the ceilings. And to the extent that there are humans at all, the humans are mostly just there to be guided by those lasers, which point to a thing on a shelf, and then point to where it's supposed to go. Humans are the last mile. Um, which is kind of grim, uh, on a certain level. I mean, that's the popular idea behind this, that we're being replaced by robots, that it's, it's all downhill from, from here. I don't actually think that. Um, I think this is kind of amazing uh, because this is what allows you to order something on Amazon and get it tomorrow. And we can talk about the economic and environmental impact of what that involves, but all things being equal. Remember that there was a time when fridges were destroying the earth. No one for a moment suggested that we get rid of fridges. All things being equal, I've never met anyone who's ever gotten something delivered the next day who wants to go back. It's a good thing. It's great. I mean, it is access. It is the ability to deliver things. Um, and short of promoting a particular sort of noxious kind of 
lifestyle myth around artisanal warehousing, this is probably the future. And this is the future because it points and makes possible a kind of expectation in the same way that the web has. Um, and right now, it's access and delivery to some pretty trivial things. Sorry, I was going to say books. I didn't mean that. I'll just say cat litter. I'm going to say this on film. I have bought cat litter on the in internet. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, the point is, is that if we can make it work for those sort of generally trivial things, I think it's fair to assume we're going to start trying, we're going to start to want to make it work for the important things. Uh, for a while now, I've been threatening to do a talk titled can we please put the Impressionists in the basement for a hundred years, at least? Needless to say, these are also fighting words in some quarters. Um, some close friends and people whose opinion I very much reflect, I respect think I'm crazy. And the argument isn't necessarily, it isn't really about the Impressionists. And it's not about their relative importance in a sort of linear history of art and society. It's not. I get it. When I talk about the Impressionists, it really is just a convenient shorthand for a class of works, a class of objects, that are taking up space, both physically and intellectually. And by virtue of our inability or our unwillingness to deal with their inertia, to deal with the inability of storage and retrieval, we are crowding out the rest of our collections. And it's really what it boils down to. Museums and archives have these, you know, you always hear these stories about how many items a museum has or an archive has. It's like, I mean, am I supposed to be impressed? It's like, wow, you have a 600 million invisible objects. Great. What am I supposed to do with that information now? I can't get to it. I can't see it. Um, so why are we keeping it? Why are we keeping it? Uh, one of the, one of the, I'll come back to that later. <laughs> the mechanics, the raw day-to-day -day issue of how you demonstrate the breadth and complexity of a collection, how you actually get it to people is real hard work. It's even harder when you're dealing with physical objects. I'm not here to argue that. We had this problem at Flickr, where somehow people thought the most exciting thing we had were HDR photos of sunsets, right? We were, we were a website built around the medium of photography. It's hard. We did a pretty bad job in the end, I think. Um, and the number of institutions who are able to make the kind of capital investment that Amazon and others have put into warehousing is probably close to zero right now. But if not laser-guided robots, then what? Um, everyone has seen, or I'm, I'm assuming most people have seen, the time-lapse photograph of a Roomba walking around a room, walking, just like, trying to figure out where to go. What do I do now? And everyone looks at them and they think they're beautiful. They're lovely. It's amazing. Look at these gorgeous patterns. Um, what is the like that for our collections? This is the part where I'm probably going to get in trouble at work. Uh, is there anyone here from the Smithsonian? Uh, that means that I can, I can pretend that everything that's on film was just doctored. Um, some of you may already know that the Smithsonian has recently launched a big national rebranding campaign in the US. We're doing a giant ad blitz under the motto, seriously amazing. Um, now, before I say the bad things, I want to make it clear that I very much chose to join the Cooper Hewitt and by extension the Smithsonian. 
I believe in what the Smithsonian represents, and I believe in its mandate, and I think it's important that it is a federal organization. I drank the Kool-Aid. But I have a couple problems with the rebranding. Uh, first, I'm not really sure how anyone hoping to reach the so-called young people of today uh, couldn't be aware of meme culture and know that they were walking into a minefield of lolcat jokes like this. Seriously. <laughs> Secondly, the ad campaign is sort of is, is built around these user stories. So we've 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 gone and we've tried to bucket the people we hope to visit the Smithsonian into sort of seven categories like the hip and the new and the mommy blogger and I mean, I know why people do this, but it seems like a real shame because instead of doing that, we could simply be talking about our collection and we could be talking about why we have it. Because honestly, this is all we'd need to say. <laughs> this is a true, seriously, this is a true statement. We totally have a spaceship. Or this. <laughs> this is a real photo. Somewhere in Washington, this happened. We could have run nothing but this photo, and never, never mind the funny ha ha text. That's just like a little piece of ancient internet meme history that I threw in for kicks. We could have run this with the Smithsonian logo at the bottom, on buses, on billboards, everywhere. And I bet it would have generated more excitement and more enthusiasm than any ad campaign we've done past or present. And I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. I mean, parrots. Um, is this an archive? Is this, a, is this an exhibition? Is this a library, albeit one with very feathery index cards? <laughs> I don't care. Everything about this photo is pure gold. The Smithsonian, <laughs> I'm kind of tempted just to end it right there now. Uh, the Smithsonian has 18,000 light fixtures, apparently. Um, the Cooper Hewitt alone has 5,000 buttons and a terrifying number of match saves, safes. These are the things that I'm discovering. Uh, the zoo at the Smithsonian has real pandas. Uh, and we have a lot of dead parrots, apparently. Um, and people love us for this. Right? This is why the Smithsonian was created. This is why we have cultural heritage institutions. People love us. Because by preserving these things, we keep open a narrative space in which to consider the meaning of things. And I wanna, I'm going to come back to that over and over and over again, the idea of keeping open a narrative space. Um, we could have simply published posters that said we were otaku before it was cool. We might have had to explain it, but it wouldn't have taken very long. We are, not just the Smithsonian, but everyone here, we are the timekeepers. Seriously. Uh, this is not one of ours. This is a photo from uh, an installation piece in uh, Amsterdam last year. And it's meant to be all of the photos uploaded to Flickr in a single day. It's meant to convey the breadth of the stories and the motive of use behind all the tiny little glimpses that we capture on camera phones and cameras. This is my friend James Bridal uh, visiting the exhibition. Uh, that's James being happy. I've never seen this in real life. <coughs> Every time I see this photo, it makes me happy. This was James Bridal's reaction about five minutes later when he discovered that there were hollow form, that all he was looking at were hollow forms over which some number of photos had been draped. And James wrote the curator eventually who replied by saying, 
In the installation, I'm trying to give a representation of the amount that is uploaded every day on Flickr. <coughs> on October 6th, I downloaded for 24 hours the images tagged IMG and in weight higher than 900K. This resulted in 950,000 downloaded images. I wanted to show the photographs as a sea of images. Therefore, I had to create the hollow mountains in the installation. But the volume represents these 950,000 images. I'm sorry if I disappointed you, but I hope this mail will clear things up a little bit. This is a good cautionary tale. Here's a picture of a bird. Um, this is a badge or a patch that the government digital services team in London made for themselves to celebrate the successful launch of the new gov.uk uh, website the other day. If you've not seen it, uh, just go to gov.uk. Uh, it is a remarkable piece of work, both in its ambition and its execution. But what I love the most about this patch are the three words down at the bottom. Trust, users, delivery. Um, and I know some of the people uh, on the design end of GDS, and one of them, I forget who, used a lovely expression to describe the work they were doing. They said, there is no design, by which they meant there is no final design, there is only reckoning, by which they meant we're going to turn this on on October 17th and people are going to start using it. Um, I tell these stories because I want to emphasize something, which is that we, as a community, we are afforded the luxury of taking care of this stuff. We are serious in our work. We have studied, we have trained, but make no mistake, it is everyone else that is letting us do this. And that's very important and very real, and we betray people's trust at a cost. We are held to a higher standard. Um, and with that comes the responsibility not only of having confidence in our collections, in what we do, but also trusting that people will be able to figure it out for themselves. Uh, sometimes, not on our terms. Uh, this is also a photo from the GDS team. This is uh, something that they put up over the windows as they began work. I love this. This is so good. Did I mention that I work at a museum that's closed until 2014? Um, that puts me in a sort of awkward position talking about some of this stuff. Uh, but at the same time, it also forces us to really rethink how people uh, access and interact with our collection. Uh, I've only been at the Cooper Hewitt for about three months now. I started in July. Um, my job is to help imagine and figure out and then actually build uh, what it means for the Cooper Hewitt to become native to the internet. A uh, couple weeks ago, we launched the public alpha of our new collection system. This is a screenshot of it. Uh, we have gone ahead and replaced the traditional e-museum system that almost every museum on the planet still uses. Um, and we are writing custom software. We are building interfaces and indexes that work for us, that are tailored to our needs. And we are trying to get away from the sort of abstract pony soup of so many shared package solutions. Um, we're trying to generate concordances between the people that we know about, the designers, the producers, the manufacturers, and people that other institutions know about, institutions like MoMA or websites like Wikipedia. This is a really big deal for us. The last thing our curators need to be doing at this point is writing another biography of Bob Dylan. It just doesn't need to happen. Um, if, we can, if we can hold hands with Wikipedia to do that, that's a big deal. Um, this is just the alpha. There is a lot of work left to do. The larger existential questions that I've been laying out so far today are not the things we're asking the visitors to the website to think about. Um, there are things that I'm thinking about as we move forward, but 
I'm trying to think about them in the way that one, that one uses soundtrack music just to create a setting, to create a mood as you move forward. Um, we're trying to build a catalog that serves both scholars and experts, but also casual visitors. And increasingly, we're trying to figure out what it means, you know, a couple years down the road for the network itself to be able to use our collection. Now, that's a little woolly and hand wavy, but it's going to happen. Um, we are trying to create a tool that does not presume or dictate a uniformity of motive. So aside from all the stuff like persistent and stable uh, identifiers, we've made everything, pretty much everything in our collection, a first class object on the internet. Um, we're trying to reimagine the whole thing as URLs. What does that mean when everything in your collection is a URL? Uh, one of the simpler things we've done is just add a random button to make explicit a kind of literal random access memory to our collection. One of the things about the random button is that it's scoped to objects that have photos. And this is really important because we and lots of other institutions have these enormous collections that haven't been digitized. So essentially what there are are key value pairs. There are records. There's descriptive text. And that's fine for those of us who live and breathe this stuff, but I think it's unfair to ask casual visitors to have that same level of understanding when they get started. Um, it turns out we have a lot of weird stuff in our collection. <laughs> my colleague Michael Walter has started a Pinterest board titled Random Button, just full of all the weird stuff he's found. This is great. This is the kind of thing we want to have happen. And there's a very important reason for that, which is we are all of us burdened one way or the other by stories of hockey stick growth. Um, I've had the, the luxury of living through that. I've been fortunate. Um, it's awesome. I would recommend it to anyone. It's hard, but it's awesome. But the reality is that it doesn't always happen. That doesn't mean that something's a failure. It just means that sometimes things take time. It means that patience, and by extension, confidence in what you're doing, is as important as a splashy debut. Sometimes it takes people a while to realize the consequence of an opportunity. It's not always immediately clear to people why what you're doing is valuable to them, for the simple reason that we all live busy lives. Um, so, we need not simply to provide access and delivery to the stuff we do, but to start thinking about it in a way that lends itself to people adapting it to their individual lives, right? What does it mean for someone to come at our collection from a, a, a bent that we haven't imagined that, you know, what does it mean for someone to only look at a collection at 2.30 in the morning? I'm just making stuff up now. but. You can imagine where it goes from there. Um, there are many ways. A random button is just one. So again, there is no design. There's only reckoning. Because this is what 2012 looks like for museums. It's not about Twitter. It's really not. Um, Twitter is just the delivery mechanism. What it's about is the fact that there's some person out there on the internet building a record of understanding about Roombas that may well rival anything we ever do, right? If you've never seen the self-aware Roomba Twitter feed, go there now. I won't, I won't be offended if you start laughing. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. Um, and beyond that, we're being forced to accept the fact that our collections are becoming alive, or at least some plausible illusion of alive. We're dealing with the fact that somebody else might be breathing life into our collections. We are starting to have to deal with the idea that it may not even be a person doing it. The fact that we're comfortable with the self-alive Roomba Twitter feed means that we're starting to believe that one day the Roomba might be doing this itself. I mentioned that we're rethinking the collection um, in terms of URLs. Uh, this is one of the things it makes possible. 
Uh, we're not doing anything with these photos of Roombas on Flickr that are tagged with the Cooper Hewitt object ID for Roombas, but we'd like to. You know, as an organization, we encourage people to take photos of our objects. We are not one of those institutions that gets all bent out of shape about image rights. Um, and by making objects first class objects on the network, we give people a way to address them. And as a design museum, as a museum that traffics in all of this stuff around us, in things that have a multiplicity of uses, that have an enormous history of people and, his, and, and just experiences behind them, that's a really big deal for us. What does it mean when, uh, in the words of my uh, colleague Seb Chan, who is Australian and apparently gets away with saying things like, we'll connect ours to yours, or vice versa, like what does that mean? That's really exciting for us. One name for this phenomena is fan fiction, um, which kind of has a bad name, undeserved I think, in the same way that uh, otaku is considered a pejorative. Uh, I like to think of fan fiction as, an, as just another kind of random access for collections, in the same way that galleries tried to be at Flickr. Um, Hergé and, and the adventures of, of Tintin are now considered masterpieces of their genre and proper culture. Um, it's worth noting <coughs> that the Tintin books are many things, not least of which is a weird kind of uh, fan fiction riffing of entire cultures, right? Think about what the Tintin books were all about. That doesn't, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Um, and if there are any Canadians of a certain age in the audience, you might, uh, you might be looking at this book cover and wondering, like I did the first time I saw it, like, when did Hergé write a history of the Meech Lake Accord? <laughs> and there's, that's interesting, right? The fact that we can start to make those associations, the fact that we can jump around. And yes, Occasionally, things like this will happen. <laughs> However, I happen to think that uh, all of the furor over this painting exposes a pretty glaring double standard. When the story first surfaced, the report suggested that an otherwise insignificant painting had been defaced. Oh well. But then, the report suddenly morphed into shock and outrage when it was discovered that it was actually somebody failing in a pretty spectacular and pretty public fashion at restoring the original work of art. Right? We were shocked at their lack of skill. The only thing that changed between those two reports was an, an awareness of the intent. So we can fault Cecilia Jimenez for her lack of uh, her lackluster representational skills. But I'm not really sure this was an affront to all of cultural heritage. Really, like not at all. All that happened was that someone was around uh, when the tree fell in the forest for once. Right? You know, in the same way that the Mona Lisa might as well be a photocopy for all that you cannot see the thing underneath all that protective glass and the protective buffers and the flashes going off. You know, in that same way, this painting has become a proxy for a whole set of debates about the roles and value of cultural artifacts and our history and our, our relationships with them. In the end, in the end, this has become a capital T thing. Someone will collect this thing now um, by virtue of all the attention. And I've heard stories uh, that the artist, are we allowed to call her that now? Um, is asking for financial compensation commensurate with her role in the piece. <laughs> Welcome to today, right? <laughs> um, these were postcards that my friend Dan Cat made, and you have to wonder now whether he's gonna get sued for image rights violation.
I'm going to read these out loud because I'm not sure um, if it's legible for people in the back. Uh, these, uh, this is a partial list of some of the places that you can check into Foursquare on uh, near a gas station in California's Central Valley. Uh, weird rest stop outside Cali State Prison where they massage you and there are <laughs> West Side Freeway. Your Congress-created Dust Bowl signs look stupid when the entire area is green. <laughs> this kind of behavior happens literally everywhere now. In New York City, um, they are obsessed with the end of days. Um, every place that you can check into, every event, is an, an opportunity to be apocalypsed. The space shuttle flying over was an attempt for, was, was an opportunity for the, the, the rapture to arrive. It's weird. It's weird, but it's really interesting to me because it demonstrates the ways in which people are expanding the surface area in which they think about place. They're still thinking about a physical and social geography, but just not one limited to administrative boundaries. Now, I believe pretty strongly that at the end of the day, our goal, at least as a museum, is to get people in the door to see the things. Because the real things continue to possess qualities that their digital proxies do not and cannot. And if that's not our goal, then we have a very real question to answer about five minutes ago, which is, in the same way, if we're not going to share any of the stuff we've got, why are we keeping it? Why do we have a building? But those proxies are important. Because, like all of these shadow places that people create, online and off, a more expansive surface, they have affordances and opportunities that the delicate and precious things we keep don't. And that's something we need to think about as we move forward. They are the scouts that we send out to imagine how we might see the past in the future. They are how we rotate our collections, or at least they're a way that we can conceptualize rotating our collections in the absence of consumer-grade robot warehouses. But even then, in a world where everyone is connected, not everyone has the luxury of travel. They are a design fiction and a way to think about how we tackle the problem of access to our collections and to prevent them from calcifying into little more than brand-driven franchises. I mean, if you really think the Impressionists are the most important thing in the universe, that's great. Just what are you doing with all this other stuff? I don't mean to be the bad man, but it's a real legitimate question. And we start to do this by simply pledging to ensure that our collection is present and, and accounted for on the network, but also by being willing to entertain what happens when those resources start to be reimagined. This is the part where I ad lib. Um, and my timer hasn't actually started. Am I doing OK? I'm good? OK. That means I've only been talking for like 20 minutes or something. <laughs> um, this is a piece by a, a local artist in New York named Jilly Ballistic. Um, Jilly Ballistic uses the subway system as both a canvas and a gallery. She, I think, um, does a series of, I've seen three types of work. Uh, one is where she ends up putting up little modal error dialogues on top of ads. If, any, if no one can read this one, it says, redundancy, 22 similar films already exist. Are you sure you want to create another copy? <laughs> She's also been going around um, wheat pasting uh, cutouts of World War I soldiers, often in gas masks, and posting them, uh, pasting them literally to the subway seats or to the posts in the subways. Um, and then she has some advisory uh, messages that she puts up. The reason I show this is because 
we have this larger question of what it means to start to be more inclusive. Ed mentioned that I'm on the advisory board for the Built Works Registry. And I'm on the advisory board because there's this idea that they want to open up the registry to community, to users. And so I went the first board meeting and I said, listen, uh, that's great, it's awesome, stable, persistent, unique identifiers for buildings, that will do, uh, that will be super helpful for scholars. But you need to understand that there are already a lot of bespoke building registries out there. They don't look like what we think of as authoritative sources, but they are. Um, you know, Foursquare is the current best one right now. It's the one that everyone thinks of. There are others like Last.fm. Last.fm tracks all the venues where they have concerts. That's a building registry. And the thing I said is you really need to understand that you can't deny someone the ability to add <coughs> their local dive bar on the grounds that it isn't an important building. Because what's going to happen is they're going to try and add the local dive bar to your registry. You're going to tell them that it's not notable. They're going to get annoyed and go for a drink and, from, and check in. And then they're just going to be like, wait, there's a giant disconnect here. The important part about that story is that the thing that's changed is that the, the unit of measure for whether or not something is important is no longer simply inclusion. In a world where we used to distribute catalogs and lists of things as printed bound volumes, it was, because there was real time and effort and money at the end of it. You had to put all those books somewhere. But in a world with the internet and databases, it's just not true. And so what that means is you start to provide an avenue for a kind of zone of safekeeping. we start to be able to think about how to preserve history in advance of it being interesting. We start to think about not kneecapping ourselves. It doesn't mean that we confer authority to it instantly. But this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity because people trust us. Facebook wants nothing more than to be that source. They're working really hard and frankly, they're building some pretty good tools. I also work on a project called Parallel Flickr, which is something I do in my spare time. And it was an attempt to reimagine an archive or a backup of my Flickr photos, not simply as a bag of photos and metadata files, of which I kept for five years but as a living, breathing thing on the internet. The argument went, if you start, for the sake of argument, from the worst case scenario, which is, what happens if Flickr went dark tomorrow? Well, that would be bad. I happen to have all my photos, um, but until recently, they really were just like directories of subdirectories of subdirectories, and occasionally there was a photo that wasn't named very well, and a an RDF file. <laughs> it, was, it was 2004. It seemed like a good idea. Um, so I could put those online, but no one would use them. And so I built software for myself to create a living, breathing shadow copy of Flickr. The idea wasn't to replace it. The idea was that there was something else that mirrored what was already happening. Now, this is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Um, occasionally, someone will say something to me like, how do you back up Flickr? How do we preserve this for all of eternity to capture all the wonderful magic and the moments that have been compiled over the last eight years? Um, and it's a pretty short answer. You buy it. You buy it and you run it, because that's the only way to preserve the trust model. Or at least, it's one way. Um, I mention that because I was talking to George Oates, who started the Flickr Commons when she was still there. And I was talking about parallel Flickr and, and this idea of like, how do you start to build out, how do you capture it all? And she said, well, what if 
What if you just started with the commons? Because that's easy pickings. Those are all under known on copyright licenses. You can grab them all. Um, but then what if you went one or two degrees of separation out? What if you tracked all of the people who had any interaction? They'd left a note, a comment, a favorite, and you archived their photos. Because then what you start to get is you start to get the fuzzy edges around the idea of the commons. You start to get a sense of who the people were that interacted. It's a little creepy to just blanket uh, back up people's photos without asking them. I mean, you could get all their public photos. So this is the thing I've been thinking about since then, which is <coughs> what if there was a way for, you know, what if the Library of Congress did this? It, it has to be a trusted institution. This is what I'm, this is the point. What if there was a way to send out a message to somebody or even just make it possible to say, yes, I totally want to include my photos in this archive. And by virtue of the fact that Parallel Flickr or whoever is running this piece of software uses Flickr itself as a validation service, that means that there's a way to preserve the trust model or the permissions model. That means that if you haven't logged in, you won't see public and private photos. But if you have logged in, then suddenly, because whoever is doing this archive is, keeping, is tracking those relationships, you can see them. And the moment that Flickr goes dark for whatever reason, I'm not, I don't want to put the fear into anyone. It would be a bad, bad day for me when that happens. But if it does, <coughs> then all those photos go dark and the 70 year rule kicks in. That's sort of an interesting way to think about it. Um, so I tossed that out. I've been trying to find someone else to build this for me because I don't, I don't have the time or the resources. Um, and I'm just going to end there. It's a little bit messy at this point, but I really want to come back to this idea that we need to think about, ultimately, we need to think about how we actually share the stuff that we do with people. That's why I think those Kiva robots are so important. Um, they're weird and creepy and amazing from a technological sort of vantage point, but really what they do is they make it possible to get things out of storage, which is still today the burden. Um, and by extension, letting people work with our stuff, letting people start to create fictions around them and taking them seriously. Taking them seriously enough to at least say we will include them or we will keep them safe. This is not the same thing as, as somebody actually canonizing something. This is a question about being able to record you know, a world that's never existed before. This is not a question about trying to create a mirror world. I'm not interested in that. What I am interested in is um, trying to sow more seeds and see what comes up afterwards. So here's a picture of a unicorn. Thank you. <laughs>
a bit more? Are you hoping that people will create their own exhibits out of the collection? Are you hoping that people will be able to explore it a bit more? Are you mostly interested in those ties, like maybe the linked data angle? Um, in the short term, we're very much interested in just the simple exploration piece. In, in um, you know, we've, we've found stuff that no one even knew was in there. Um, and it is also, from a very practical perspective, it's important to us because we are closed. And we need to have some way to stay front of mind. Um, beyond that, uh, another way to answer that question is um, we want people to link to those objects. We, you know, it is our mandate, our opportunity is to be that canonical source for things. Um, and I joined a design museum, not another kind of museum for very, like, because, because it was a design museum. It's a really good time to be thinking about what it means to collect design. No one, it, it, especially as design keeps getting sort of more of more ephemeral. Um, what does it mean for us to collect experience design? What, what is that? Um, I joke with people that we are going to collect, uh, we're gonna acquire the war on terror as an example of service design, which is funny until you're like, oh yeah, right? Um, I think that one of the things you see going on, you've seen going on for the last couple of years is that um, Facebook and Wikipedia are in a, a low bandwidth war of attrition about who gets to be your dictionary. Um, Facebook wants it more than, I mean Wikipedia just got there by virtue of being around for 10 years and being a valuable resource. Um, Facebook would like to do to the dictionary what they did to your address book. Um, and I think that our opportunity as a cultural heritage institution, as an institution of trust that, that's devoted to, to the future and, and the past, that's a real opportunity for us. So when people look at you know, that projector, we should have a record of it. So. Um, this is... Uh, sort of stemming from your comment that you want to be able to check into your local dive bar because it's important to you. Yeah. Do you think um, it's time for Wikipedia to stop deleting pages that people work on? Like, if someone goes to Wikipedia and works on a page, and there's collaborators that work on that page, and then one of the thousand Wikipedia important editors comes along and says, no, that's not important enough to be in Wikipedia, so we're going to delete it. If the storage is cheap, if the storage is show, is if the storage gets to be cheap enough that it doesn't matter anymore, if the cost of storing that page is basically nothing, when are we going to get to the point when, just because five people are interested in a topic, that page should stay around? I, I just interested in what you think about Wikipedia deleting things based on their idea of what is important and what isn't. Um, so Ed mentioned that I am co-director of the Spinney Bar Historical Society. <clears throat> We have a long-running debate with the Wikipedians because they don't think we're a serious thing and they keep removing us from, um, from the page about revolving restaurants. Uh, we created a one-page manifesto and put it on Lulu so that we could get an ISBN um, so that we could then be cited. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the present. <laughs> uh, I don't think that Wikipedia necessarily has a responsibility to be all things to all people. Um, I think they have a responsibility to be clear in what they are and what the ground rules are. Um, a, a friend of mine in 2007, I don't think the paper's online anymore, I'll try and dig it up, um, but it was a friend named Dave Beckett who is part of the big in the semantic web community and he wrote a paper called where he, he was talking about building a tagopedia. And the reason was, he said, you know, you could start to see it was sort of the, the eruption of all of these tagging systems at Delicious and Flickr and all over the place. And, and nobody, was, nobody had the time to worry about building systems of equivalencies. So there was a lot of sort of overlap and mismatch. 
And Dave's argument was, well, you know, Wikipedia seems like a natural place, uh, except that they're not a dictionary. They don't want to be a dictionary. Um, so maybe we need to build Tagopedia. I mean, the great value of Wikipedia is that whole infrastructure that they've built for doing disambiguation, for recognizing and flagging dispute. Um, should they be deleting it? I, I guess if I had to, I, yeah, if you were going to put me on the spot, I'm sure. It's their prerogative. They can do that. Um, what I want is for everyone else to start putting stuff on the network. It's that idea of being present, at least just standing up and saying, I am here. When, when I was still at Flickr, we did the machine tags project, which was essentially semantic web triples. And for some of them, we would go out and we would, we would find the actual resource on the internet and we would say, what is your title? What is your name? And so we did this for uh, subway stations. So City of Montreal, awesome. They have a web page for every subway station. That's great. Uh, the MTA in New York still don't. Really frustrating. And one of my coworkers said, why don't we just point to the Wikipedia page? I mean, they have more information about these subway stations than anyone else. And I said, yeah, they do, but I don't, I'd rather not. I want for the MTA to start to think about what it means for them to own, to nourish, to squeeze inappropriately their own stuff. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>